This podcast is brought to you by the Resolve Long Horizon Investing Masterclass, a 10-part evergreen podcast series where Adam Butler, Mike Philbrick, and Rodrigo Gordillo of Resolve Asset Management Global explore an advanced investment framework specifically designed to steward quasi-permanent capital with humility and balance. From the science of decision-making to all-weather portfolio construction to the value of diversified alpha and tail protection, this series provides a comprehensive capital management roadmap to improve outcomes for wealthy individuals, advisors, family offices, and institutions managing less than $10 billion. To listen to the series or read the transcripts on demand, please visit investresolve.com forward slash masterclass. Alternatively, you can find it on your favorite podcast player by searching for Resolve Dash Masterclass. Well, can you believe it's another Friday? Yes, Fantastic. Sir. These are rolling high. Groovy opening tune there, my guys. Yeah, we don't mess around. Tune. Cheers, all. Yeah, cheers, cheers, cheers. Another cheers. happy cheers. hour. And a, and a long cheers. weekend Friday happy hour. Yeah, that's right. Was it a long weekend in the U.S.? Friends. Yeah, Memorial Day this weekend. All right. All right all so right. I found uh, gluten-free beer. Oh it is God. possible. Is it any good? Wow. Is it flavor feed too? Or is it I can't any- quite tell. But the second beer has gluten in it, so I don't know if it really counts drinking a gluten one free before it. Yeah. So it goes. <laughs> I do feel well, like that may defeat the purpose. Put off the uh, the intestinal discomfort for one beer. Sounds That's reasonable. True. Yeah. yeah. Sounds reasonable. So just before we get started, I uh, want to make sure that everyone understands we have lots of wide ranging conversations on this particular video podcast, and nothing that you're going to hear from these four scallywags is advice. It is purely financial entertainment. So make sure you keep that in mind. And um, that should get us started. And and um, Robert, welcome to the show. And Thanks, I, I think I think to get us started, um, you might be a, a slightly uh, less known guest for for everyone on on the, the tunes into the show. So I'd love you to give your history where you're at what you're doing, how you got there, and uh, give us a sense of uh, who we're talking to. And then we're going to pepper you with all kinds of fun things, questions and whatnot. So hit us yeah, with that. It. Happy to. And, and, and appreciate you guys for <clears throat> bringing me with you. Um, so I, my, my investment career started uh, coming out of school. I got, I got into it through the institutional side. So I worked at a, a private equity firm, Elevation Partners, for about six years or so. And uh, that firm took a little bit of a unique repro- approach. And they said, we're going to take guys out of private equity and we're going to take guys that are operators. And we're going to put them together. They're going to be equal partners running a private equity firm. And we're specifically going to go and invest in media companies whose business models are being upended by the web. And the original idea was, well, let's take really big brands like Forbes. So we bought half of Forbes. And then let's turn them from a legacy magazine company into the number one online destination for everything financial and business news. That turned out to be an incredibly difficult investment thesis to actually execute. Uh, But while we were doing that, we learned that there were a number of new uh, media business models forming around the web, and we could just invest in these pure play new businesses as opposed to trying to turn the old ones around. Uh, So we ended up investing in companies like Yelp. Uh, We were early investors in Facebook, and that ended up being a very good outcome uh, uh, for um, for the firm. Uh, After that, uh, I spent a couple of years at at a long, short hedge fund uh, what was cool is a lot of the companies we've been studying privately at, at Elevation were then coming into the uh, into the public market. Uh, so that was the first half of my career was was everything was institutional, um, institutionally related. Uh, after that, you know, the, one of the early insights I had was I was sort of envious of the operating partners at Elevation. You had guys from Apple, from Electronic Arts, Bono from U2, who is as good of a businessman as he is a singer. And... I looked at that and said, well, gosh, how can I get the operator experience so I can be both the investor and the operator uh, sitting at that table one day? And um, I was fortunate where a a good uh, friend and colleague of mine from Elevation, Michael Praisman, um, started his company Everlane. So this was back in 2010. Uh, This was before even Instagram was acquired by Facebook. Uh, to give you some sense of where the early DTC direct consumer brands were starting to think about how to position themselves. So when Everlane was founded, 
uh, e-commerce on the web was already really efficient. You had Amazon, you had eBay, you had Craigslist. So if you knew what you were going to buy, there was a low price and fast shipping uh, available to get it. Uh, but if you didn't know what you were going to buy, that more curated boutique experience of going into premium stores, this works per excuse me, particularly well in fashion retail, that part hadn't yet really been figured out online. So Everlane was formed with the concept of how do we create a store uh, that is inspiring where we help people find the products that they're gonna buy that they didn't even necessarily have an intention of purchasing when they came in here. And along the way, we ended up building really the modern version of J. Crew. And the reason we were able to do that was because Gap and J. Crew were sitting there with thousands of stores with tons of debt, and they were treating the internet like an outlet store. And we did the opposite. We said, hold on, the website is the very first place customers are interacting with you. That should be your most premium product, your most premium customer experience, not an afterthought liquidation channel for all the stores that you were operating in. And so we were able to build this brand Everlane uh, completely online uh, and a couple hundred million dollars in revenue later, the brand was then big enough to start opening physical stores. So we ironically had completed the full circle. Uh, and so I stepped, uh, uh, I stepped away there a couple of years ago. Uh, and in finding my way back into investment management, I was really curious about finding an opportunity to build a company as opposed to an opportunity simply to manage money. And this I'm, I'm sure we'll speak a good bit about, uh, but I was really fascinated by um, this question of why hasn't every single mutual fund converted its fund into an ETF? It's more liquid. It's more tax efficient, and they can probably charge a lower price to all their investors. And if, if all of them should be doing it, but none of them are doing it, something's going on. And what I've found so far is that the average mutual fund has seven or eight different share classes attached to it. Each one of those share classes has a different uh, price or fee structure. And they're able to discriminate based off of the investor they're selling that fund into, whether it's a school, an individual, a financial advisor, and charge them a different fee. And that price discrimination gets them that extra 20 bips or so of margin that flows through you know, their income statement and drives a lot of their operating margins. Because if they were to take that fund and make that same fund available as an ETF, and they'd have to price it to the lowest common denominator, well, all those investors would just say, well, what do I need this exotic mutual fund class for? I can just hold the ETF version of this and, and we'd all be better. So I was seeing the Gap J. Crew story play out all over again, where they're not treating the modern vehicle as the premium vehicle. And what that does is it creates a vacuum in the marketplace for new brands to form. And so that's what I'm trying to do with Upholdings, which is really to be a pure play, actively managed uh, ETF company. And we've only got one today, Compound Kings, and we're only going to have one for the foreseeable future because every we're a small company, so all of our resources have to be poured into you know picking the best stocks and managing that portfolio really well. Uh, I don't believe we're going to be the only folks doing this. Uh, other people are going to come, just like we saw in the direct consumer expansion over the last decade on the um, in fashion and lifestyle. Uh, but I'm excited to hopefully play a, a big part of that. Um, uh, tidal wave and renaissance of actively managed product uh, over the next decade. Rob, just before we get into the product and you know how you think about concentration and all that fun stuff, I want to ask you a question about the cost of an ETF. You said something that has always been curious for me, the, the, this idea that ETFs uh, cost less to run than a mutual fund. Um, why is uh, it, it doesn't seem to me that it should in, in any way. Well, we, we've looked at structures before. I mean, running, a, running an, a, an ETF is pretty expensive. Um, and it seems to be just as expensive as mutual funds. The only difference is that for some reason from a, I don't know, um, just, a, just doing what, what has been done in the past, mutual funds charge more than ETFs. And if you run an ETF, you can't charge more than 60 beeps. Like, what... What, why is it cheaper, if in fact it is? Or is it just pricing cheaper for cultural? Well, I think it's scale. So look, if, if you're gonna run um, you know, smaller fund strategies that have, have caps on them, I completely understand why you'd, use a, why you'd use a mutual fund or an interval fund to do that, because you can keep the capital capped 
Uh, and as, as you pointed out, it's easier to be more exotic uh, and potentially manager aligned with the fee structure. Uh, but at scale, I mean, my rough from having, you know, worked with all the potential intermediate. So I was running a hedge fund uh, for a couple of years. And I'll give a little background of how I got here. And then I'll, I'll get to the answer of what do I see on the operating expense side for an ETF versus a mutual fund. So I opened after I left Everlane, I, I a couple of nice friends said, hey, you know, Robert, that was that was really cool how you helped allocate capital for a young growth company. You've invested in other companies in the past. Can you do cool investing stuff for us? Uh, and the easiest and lowest cost way to start managing money for other people is to open a hedge fund. Uh, it's unregulated. It's very relatively low uh, overhead uh, from a legal standpoint. The challenge is you can only have accredited investors. So everyone's got to be rich already. And uh, so th this was something I started doing. I was doing it for uh, five to 10 people right after I got past person number 10, I took the same sort of, you know, 30 page subscription agreement. I took the 50 page LLC operating agreement. I put the pages in front of the investor and I said, you know, these are all the things you're supposed to read here are the things that are really important. And they're like, Robert, I'm not going to read any of this. Um, I'd like to just invest with you. Yeah. And I was, you know, that was one of my moments where I was like, you know what? They're absolutely right. Like, we have the internet. Why is this the process? And so that's what started me down the, the trail of, you know, there's opportunities to register this as a 40 act fund. And I can do it as a mutual fund. I can do it as an interval fund. I can do it as an ETF. And uh, so I, I talked to the, I talked to the um, intermediaries that you'd have to talk to, to register it as a mutual fund and distribute it as such. And if you look at the gross margin structures of, Artisan or T. Rowe, these are all public companies today. They have 60 to 70 percent uh, gross margin uh, where they run their funds. And the math that I was getting from quotes of these service providers that as we would scale kind of showed me the same thing, where as I grow, um, uh, my long term gross margin would get to you know mid 60s or something like that. Um, right. Starting around the time you get to about a billion dollars in capital under management. And um, the, now on the ETF side. Uh, a brief sort of side story. And again, I'm sure this is well trodden uh, um, research for, for a lot of um, a lot of your community is a lot of a lot of the sort of the pioneers and the cowboys uh, five to 10 years ago opened up their first ETFs. And I'll use the guys at Alpha Architect that even introduced all of us like they were cowboys coming out with ETFs before it was known that that, that could be a, a way to really grow uh, assets under management. And they did a great job. They got there with, you know, a handful of funds that they have. And then they got to a certain size and they said, you know, we could keep growing our funds or hang on a second. We have this regulatory infrastructure that we've built that would allow someone else to run their ETF on our original investment. And I think one of the big differences in the ETF world versus the mutual fund world is this army of cowboys that have gone out there and built these very robust regulatory operations and trading platforms are competing with each other. They're experiencing their own economies of scale. And when I look at building the same ETF and getting to that magical billion dollars of assets under management, the gross margin is like 80 to 90%. So you're looking at 10 to 15 bips of pickup from operating an ETF at scale uh, and presumably there's, there continues to be, you know, improvements to that scale as the whole industry continues to evolve. And if you're pitching that up against the mutual fund, as we talked about in the beginning, the challenge the mutual funds has is their price discriminating to get themselves closer to 80 bips. And I look at that and say, well, I can charge 60 bips and still ultimately get to a 15 to 20 point operating margin long-term knowing how much leverage there is, uh, at the gross margin level. So I, you know, we're getting a little into the income statement here. Uh, but that's my experience so far. No, that's useful. And so um, uh, Compound Kings, I guess, yeah. is then an ETF by, it's just by upholdings. Could could you explain that sort of, since we're in the structure uh, rabbit hole, how, how did, because <laughs> it's a little bit confusing to me. Just so, watching? Yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> well, one, just one, but let's just tie that down uh, quick. Just to, yeah, um, yeah. So uh, Upholdings is a we're a federally registered investment advisor. 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure much like Resolve. And so up, mm-hmm. Upholdings is the brand. Upholdings is the uh, is the is the powerhouse of doing enormous amounts of research and co- picking individual stocks that we think can outperform the S and P 500. Uh, that's what Upholdings' responsibility is. Mm-hmm. Uh, Compound Kings is today the sole vehicle through which to access the stock picking and research of the Upholdings house. Got it. And. You know, as, as you've pointed out, I'm, I'm the, you know, young entrepreneur that's sitting here banging the ETF drum, you know, crazily. And it's possible that I'm going to get into this business and 10 years later, I'm going to have a private fund, an ETF, a mutual fund, an interval fund. I'd like to believe that everything can be done with ETF, uh, but I'm not so close minded to know that, you know, I'm going to learn a bunch of things along the way. I wonder if if at some point that's all going to move to some sort of blockchain type fund management as well hopefully yeah then we're talking you talk about being liquid right now every etf it's you know it's it's constrained to a country it's constrained to market hours Mm -hmm. i would love my fund to be unconstrained to hours unconstrained to geography i guarantee you every cfo of a publicly listed company would love to have themselves globally listed at any time you talk about improving your liquidity that would be something. I mean, today oh, yeah. we're having a fight. Look, look what's happening right now between China and the U.S. and these Chinese listed securities that are like, uh, I don't know, the U.S. is being confusing. Let's do a listing in Hong Kong. Let's do a listing in Shanghai and we'll do a listing in London. That stuff is absolutely going to be relics when securities are trading on blockchain. Yeah, agreed. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole anymore because I want to <laughs> jump into I want to get into the investing nuts and bolts of of uh the cantwell brain the the concentration versus diversity uh, the reason for it why it's so important today why it's much more important today than than in 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 the past in your view and and how you view that and maybe how you are sort of walking through the screening process to boil those those ideas down boil the ocean down to a reasonable set of ideas that you think are meaningful yeah sure um we'll start with the simplest stuff which is you want to you want to pick industries that have some good secular tailwinds behind them uh in which you see companies grabbing large chunks of market share uh going very far back there's a very high correlation between the amount of market share you have and the level of operating margins you're able to sustain over long periods of time um so i'd say at a high level we start there and so what that means is you're looking at, at, at businesses that have very large end markets. And you know that there, there's a lot of companies in the US that serve both the US and the rest of the world. And there's a lot of companies in China that serve primarily China and do a little bit outside of there. But those are the two largest end markets that we currently you know, see and have access to. And it, sometimes we'll take a peek at growth companies in South Korea or in South America, but usually we fail to see those technologies uh, do well outside of their own borders. So they're, it's a little bit less inter- interesting to us because it's it's constrained. It's not unconstrained. Um, beneath that, you then want to know that you've got a business model that can generate cash. And when you're investing in companies, sometimes that are you know pre-public, but late stage private or recently public, it's a very dynamic time for a business. Uh, Often they'll be profitable, certainly profitable at the gross profit level, uh, usually profitable after subtracting their marketing expenses. But after you take out R&D and G&A and everything else, sometimes these companies are unprofitable while they're still in higher um, stages of growth. So I would say we focus on companies that are near uh, generating positive cash flow or are already generating positive cash flow. And then the second feature of that is, do they have things to do with that money? Uh, because you know we have an investment horizon where we want these companies to be putting this capital to work for us, as opposed to you know sending it back or buying back shares or, or anything like that. Um, so those are the really the two core features of a compound king: is is it or can it make money? And then when it makes that money, does it have good places to put it? How do you source those ideas? Like what kind of technical or social infrastructure do you lean on in order to? narrow that down, but it also ensure that you've got, I mean, you're talking about opportunities in China and 
in South yeah. Korea. So what's involved there? It's a pretty good question. Um, as I said, as I mentioned, where we like to start at the industry. And so you start with an industry that you like and you put the key players in it and you take a look at what's happening to market share within that industry. So I'm going to we'll pick on uh, digital advertising for a second. Uh, Google has obviously built a very you know strong competitive mode for very many reasons. But then you had social media advertising come along uh, and then you had the rise of TikTok and YouTube is having a renaissance where you know creators are getting paid. So within this digital advertising universe, there are kind of three segments of, of money spent. You've got search advertising, uh, you've got uh, performance advertising on social media, and then you've got brand advertising in the YouTubes and the TikToks of the world. And uh, what's happened here is uh, Amazon has entered the game. Uh, and Amazon said, hold on a second, we have a ton of organic traffic to our site. Why are people going on Google, searching something, clicking a Google ad, and then coming to Amazon to purchase from us? And so over the last five or seven years, you've seen pretty significant deterioration in uh, Google's online advertising market share. You've seen Amazon take a lot of that market share. Uh, you've seen Facebook miraculously hold share uh, that entire way. And then, so those, that's what's happening at the majors. And then you look, you know, what about the companies that weren't public yet? So Pinterest, not too long ago, was a private company. They were starting to gain share kind of, you had, so you had the second tier of, you had Twitter and you had LinkedIn, and then the third tier of Snap, um, uh, Snapchat and Pinterest. And we're paying very close attention to how is it that market share gains are happening at, at different sort of sizes within the digital advertising ecosystem. And for a period of time, Pinterest was showing some pretty tremendous growth and was available at a pretty darn cheap price uh, in the public market. And there was a time a year ago where Pinterest was a phenomenal stock for us to own. Uh, that got caught up in the hullabaloo of all the stocks that got carried to insane valuations back in December and January. And so we had to get rid of it. Uh, but Facebook continued to outdeliver, continued to sustain its market share position and it was available at a better price than it's been in the past handful of years. And so now Facebook is obviously a more attractive investment to us. So it, the screening, as I mentioned, it kind of starts at the industry level. We're willing to invest in anywhere from the majors to the emergence, uh, but we're really stubborn about the price that we're willing to pay and whether or not those companies are gaining share within their industries, holding it flat or losing it altogether. Yeah, so let me be a little clearer because I, I'm, I'm interested in sort of the um, what what software databases um ah. social um connection networks or infrastructure right are you using it because you know i'm sort of thinking gix there's what 60 odd gix sub industries and we haven't done sub industries in a long time but like this this is a fairly broad there's a lot of data here so mm -hmm. where do you start from a data standpoint how do you drill in um to make sure that you're you know because there's like there's type one error, there's type two error, right? Type one error, um, you're zeroing in on an industry that seems interesting, turns out it isn't. Type two error, you're ignoring an industry that is actually really interesting, but just didn't show up on your, uh, on your radar, right? So how do, you, how do you manage that trade off from a process standpoint and what sort of infrastructure do you use to, um, to optimize that? Yeah. Um... I'll answer the last part first, and then I'll talk about you know the specific tools and you know pieces of software that are we actually use. So uh, this is, I think this is a little bit of a strength, but also a weakness of, of Compound Kings is that you know as the portfolio manager, uh, Compound Kings is going to be a bit limited to industries in which I have some amount of expertise, which is advertising, commerce, enterprise software, uh, and a little bit of payments. So. I, uh, and also, I'll say, you know, thesis wise or as active management goes, I believe that anyone can make money in any category that they're an expert in. Uh, however, the investment strategy that you run needs to be appropriate for the types of opportunities that those industries afford you. So if I was an energy investor, I'd kind of have to be a long short investor that runs a neutral portfolio because there's so much turmoil 
taking place over the losers versus who are the new winners going to be, that is difficult to just invest in the compounders or invest in the winners. So I think each, I think industries can have different sort of investment um, strategies attached to them. Um, so I'm, I'm a bit beholden to the industries that I know, you know, as we get bigger over time and need to find more opportunities, I think it's about hiring experts within those areas to then skewer through and come up with whether or not there are attractive uh, investment opportunities. Um, the, to talk about specific tools, um, I mean, it's as simple, or it's not as simple, but um, I mentioned we, we like to start with operating statistics, but when we don't use operating statistics and we potentially start with market stats on how things have traded and we screen for how stocks have traded relative to one another, I'm running Excel with Cap IQ plugins. And you know we've got long, long lists of the operating stats that we follow. A stat that I really like is gross profit minus marketing. Uh, as I previewed earlier, companies that will likely become cash generators in the future, but may not yet today, are typically growing their gross profit minus marketing uh, very quickly. Um, so that is like one specific screen that like we'll, we'll track pretty closely. Um, sometimes when we're relying on things like share prices in, in our Friday recap earlier today, I shared, talked about the S&P 500 has been up 14% since the beginning of the year. If you were to take the basket of cloud services stocks that do infrastructure, that do business uh, as an operating system, like a Workday or a ServiceNow, or you take the individual application providers like a DocuSign or Navalera, that entire bucket of businesses is down 20% or so since the start of the year. So you have basically a whole category of businesses whose fundamentals are going to grow faster than the S&P 500, whose valuations have pulled back 30% from where the S&P has performed, that now is an area where we're gonna spend a lot more time figuring out if we're allocated enough uh, into the category. Does that get more into the specific screening yeah, stuff? Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I think the, the, if I could distill the sort of salient thrust of your point there, like you have a certain expertise that's largely a function of your background and um, you're going to lean on that fairly heavily. And, and the prior there is that this category is a growth category. And therefore, you know, you're looking for long opportunities. You're looking for long tail outcomes. And um, you can therefore, you know, you know what the investment style is and you know what your expertise is. And, and you're looking for the Venn where that Venn diagram overlaps, um, which, yeah. So that was a much cleaner way of saying it. Yeah. Um, so my understanding, one of the things we talked about sort of pre-show was that, um, you have strong conviction in the view that a concentrated style is, um, is a well positioned for the ETF structure, right? The active ETF structure. Cause I think that's potentially not with any sort of arc um concentrated etf investing is sort of almost anathema right so this is, you're, you're almost inventing a new category here um <laughs> but uh how do you how do you overcome some of the rules like some of the concentration regulatory rules around um you know concentrated positions in mutual funds and etfs and then when we get past that i'd, I'd love to understand how you manage a portfolio of concentrated positions because it really is a very it's a totally different way of thinking about the problem than what we're typically used to so yeah let's start with why the mutual fund structure is useful for your style it's a big topic uh let's get the easiest part out of the way first which is the legal requirements and what are the concentration rules and limits and stuff like that so uh the minimum is the irs has a rule that says um any position that is 5% or greater, no more than 50% of the fund can be made up of positions that large. So as the lawyers like to say it, that means, you know, in a concentrated fund, you can have two quarters or 10 nickels, uh, depending on how you want to concentrate at the, the top end of it. So that's the IRS requirement. Uh, the SEC actually takes it a step further and says, um, you know, no more than 75% of the fund uh, can look like that, or no more, excuse me, 25%. Uh, and so, under the SEC's designation, we are technically a non-diversified fund. 
under the IRS's rules, we are a diversified fund. And you don't want to trip the IRS rule because if you do, then you then they call you a company. And then that fund is paying taxes at the corporate level, just like it's a company, as opposed to a fund holding stocks and other businesses. So that's the quick, uh, those, are, those are the legal rules. Now, um, speaking to an investment strategy, for us, where everything is heavily research-based, uh, it's about finding what we believe are disjointed opportunities in the market. Uh, Alibaba at 15% of our portfolio, we are putting our money where our mouth is saying that that security is undervalued relative to the size and intrinsic value of the business. I don't actually, this is where the ETFs have an enormous advantage over the mutual fund is that that pricing discrepancy exists today. Alibaba could rally 50% over the next 12 months. Their fundamentals could deteriorate. There's no way I'd want to be holding a 20% position in Alibaba with deteriorating fundamentals. And the ETF allows me to exchange those shares for another business's shares without doing what the mutual fund did, which is, well, to do that, you'd have to actually sell the shares outright, pass that capital gain down you know, to your uh, fund investors, and they'd be paying taxes along the way as you move between those positions. So if, if your intention is a highly concentrated performance strategy, I don't know of any other vehicle that allows me to do that um, uh, so seamlessly. So just, just, just so I can pull on that a little bit. So yeah. I think the implication there was that because you're running or the intention is to run a relatively concentrated strategy, that aligns with the imperative of being able to be nimble. And mm. when you want to be nimble, you don't want the tax tail to wag the investment strategy dog, right? So you got it. the active ETF allows you to be nimble without having to be um, driven by or um, motivated by the, the tax consequences of those moves. Exactly. On, on the other hand, how do you feel about the disclosure requirements you know, it giving away sort of the, the portfolio holdings in such a rapid way, which is sort of avoided in the in the more traditional mutual fund stance? I, so far, I like it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, transparency I, is something you, you've sort of pr pride yourself on, yeah. it seems so. I, it's helped Kathy, hasn't it? I would think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's now like Bloomberg breaking news when, you know, she makes a rotation in her portfolio and it, it, she, she, it happens during the day. It gets reported at the end of the day. Uh, but I don't think it, it's interesting. You know, the other other folks at Advantage ETFs that I've had conversations with about this is uh, when I talked to a couple of mutual fund people originally, they're like, oh, you're going to have to share your portfolio and you're going to get front run when you're trying to you know build positions. And. I, I went to an ETF conference and I asked every single person I could find there if they've ever been front run. And I, I wasn't I wasn't hearing the theoretical problem that was laid out by a lot of the a lot of the uh, traditionally active guys. So until it's a problem, again, we have the there is a non transparent ETF option that's available. It's not sw switching a flip. Uh, Flipping a switch. I screwed that up, didn't I? <laughs> I thought we you have, said we it. We have lots of dyslexics more. on our team. Yeah. Oh God. Far I, more I've never, I never understood that oh, until now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, but, sometimes I get my merds mixed up too. <laughs> but within three months, we could work with the SEC and we could flip back to a non-transparent fund. So my, my, I would say my stance on it is be as customer friendly as possible unless the market really prevents that from being feasible. And if it's going to be better for our clients ultimately to run it non-transparent because we start running into you know stuff like that, we can always turn it on. But by default, until it actually becomes a problem, I think it's silly to solve for that. Well, also, if you're if you're primarily holding um, ultra large caps, you know, like if you're holding Alibaba and and uh, Facebook, then you're unlikely to run into any sort of flows issues, right? Like the underlying liquidity yeah. is, is sufficient. Yeah, we'll see. I don't want to sound too much like a trader here, but it's been a very volatile market of the past 12 months. And six months ago, you know, Pinterest, Airbnb, and uh, 
Etsy were our three largest positions. And those were great stocks to own. And we own them in much smaller positions today because their valuations don't warrant a lot. But it's because I think those large conglomerates are so undervalued um, in the current market. And that's why they're up there. But if, if we think that there's a similar mispricing taking place in other securities and those things feel more fairly valued, I, I aspire not to be shy about moving the do, portfolio there. Do you have the, the do you have the opportunity and and um, I guess proclivity to to sort of go down the cap spectrum? Is that something that you would be interested in, into mid caps or um, small caps even? Is that or is that something yeah. you're, you're more no, big time? But I actually think as you just laid it out, I think the market that we're in right now is the 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 big caps have the have below average multiples. The mid caps have above average multiples and the small caps have nosebleed multiples so i we almost need to see a little bit of a reversal there uh for the i think the portfolio to start reconstituting around small and people ask us because airbnb was a private investment for us one other cool feature about 40 act funds is up to 15 percent of the fund can go into private companies and now that airbnb is public you know and the investors have been like cool robert can you like make another private company investment for us and it's shit like the the rise of the SPACs like the volume of IPOs that have happened like there's no good ones left like yeah. you gotta no, wait the, for like the next class the multiples on modern vintages for for PE and virtually every sector have just been yeah yeah it's, it's untouchable it yeah. is untouchable yeah for sure um Okay, so I can t I can see you're absolutely bursting at the seams to talk about your true passion, which is clearly this this extraordinary research process, right? This deep research, <laughs> this like heavily involved. Okay, okay. So let's let's hear it, man. Oh, What's man. what goes into what goes into this um, into this process? That's a good way to ask the question. <laughs> um, other investors, a lot of other active investors, sometimes they'll have, um, they have really well honed answers to that question. Uh, a couple of buddies of mine at a large hedge fund, they always say are the number one most important thing to us in making investment is we talk to the five people that know more about this company than anybody else. I've always thought that was like a really cool approach because it sounds very simple, but it's very difficult to execute. You have to figure out who those people might be. You have to get them to talk to you. And you have to attempt to understand. They have decades of context and they're explaining it to you and you have months of context. And so you may not even be understanding the profundity of the things that they're even sharing with you. Um, but I, 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 respect the, I respect the simplicity of that approach. So I, I mentioned that because speaking to people in and around the companies that you want to participate in is really important. Um, and we usually start with customers. So like we, we, we want the products to be highly valued uh, by the customers themselves, whether it's enterprise software, whether it's Amazon retail, whether it's, you know, Netflix, you know, shows and this and that. As you start with the customers, uh, then we'll usually speak to people that have worked uh, at the company. Uh, and so that's on more of the qualitative um, uh, human to human side. Uh, on, the, on the financial modeling side, I think there's there's some funny quote somewhere. I don't remember. I'm terrible at remembering quotes, but they always say, you know, the best alpha that you can have is a longer time horizon uh, than than the market uh, uh, or than the current participants in the market. And so any time that we're valuing a business, we're valuing the business off of its share count, uh, you know, free cash flow generation uh, in five years, you know, 2026. So every company that we're looking at in our portfolio, we're looking at how is that company valued relative to our best guess or our range of outcomes of what it's going to be worth, uh, five years from now. Um, and that way, you know, when stocks trade, so I talked a little bit about some of these cloud services companies, you know, trading down a little bit and let, like valuations off 30%, but you know, they miss revenue targets by like one and a half or 2%. That's th those are the sorts of opportunities that the market presents to you, where if, if you're just focusing on managing your portfolio off of 2026 numbers, 
you you care enough about the quarters to track what's happening competitively with these companies, but you don't care so much about the precision of the growth rates to be trading your position too aggressively. Uh, so you talk to the people, uh, you get your own numbers right. And then I think the last piece of the process is that's the portfolio manager's uh, sizing responsibility, which is how big is the market the company is in? That can usually be a big position. How attractive is the price relative to what you think the thing's going to be valued at in five years? And you know those two elements usually drive how big of a weighting you're usually willing to give to a single position uh, in the portfolio. So dig into that five-year cash flow forecast a little bit for me because yep. I think obviously you, you've been around long enough to understand, but, but for the benefit of people um, listening, obviously prices of equities, prices of any asset are a function of the current expectations of investors, right? The average of current expectations of investors. So if you think an asset is undervalued or overvalued, it means you've got a variant perception. Your your view is different than the markets. So I guess I'm curious, what do you feel are the sources of your variant perceptions? What What insights are you trying to bring to the research process that allow you to see into the future in a way that the average market participant isn't. Um, there's there's two there's two pieces there. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna separate the the philosophy of seeing things that you know quote the market may not see, uh, and then separately again like before, talk about some of the tools and other things that we think about in getting to that year five number. Um, so I, for me, it's less about um, having a variant perception to the market. Uh, my, the best way I can sum it up so far is that uh, the market demonstrates fear uh, around different categories at different moments in time. And if you've built a company for long enough, you know that every company faces all sorts of weird things over the duration of its life. It is not a smooth, you know, straight line uh, up to success. And if you've done your work to know that the quality of the business is high enough, uh, you don't get too scared about rapid gyrations and valuations. So honestly, the best example of this is Airbnb with the pandemic. So a little bit of history on Airbnb. Airbnb... Um, raised a ton of money in private markets. Uh, in 2015, there was a little bit of bubble happening in private markets. They hadn't really gone public yet. Once some of these companies started going public, their valuations got totally crapped on. So Airbnb kind of was stagnated at this 40-ish billion dollar valuation from 2015 that was clearly overvalued. All the way up you know, into 2018, the business's fundamentals had started to grow into that number. Uh, but it lost all the attraction of the venture investors that were grinding up, you know, the price of that business over time. Uh, early investors were getting really tired because they said, you know, normally when we invest in a company that's successful, there's been some sort of realization event that's happened already. So it fell. Airbnb as a private company essentially became less liquid the bigger that it got. And the irony is that the underlying business actually grew up into that valuation. So the first time we bought private shares is a $40 billion company. And we kept buying a little bit. We bought a little bit more at 45. And then uh, Corona happened. And everyone was afraid that no one would ever travel again. Uh, Airbnb's price, I think Silver Lake did a deal at $18 billion or something like that with warrants. And even in the private, the little liquidity that was happening in the private markets, we were able to go in there shortly after Silver Lake and buy more Airbnb at $25 billion. Because if you're focusing on the five-year or the seven-year or the 10-year number for a business like that, whose market share position didn't change during certainly the beginning of the onset of the pandemic, there was simply a, call it exogenous industry shock that happened. As the investor, you're like, okay, well, I can never predict what's going to happen at the industry level. Presumably that's going to be boom and bust or whatever. Uh, but now all of a sudden I'm getting this asset at, at $25 billion. It took a very short number of months for them to become public and the market to say, 
dear God, that wasn't the right price. Look at how quickly this company has recovered. They're coming back to their booking levels far faster than we thought. It traded up to 100 to $120 billion. It's back at around 80. It's probably a little bit overpriced now. You know, I wish it was a $50 billion company and I could own more, but you don't get to pick, you know, the market picks. Um, so I share that experience because I don't know at which moment in there was quite the variant perception to what the market was giving because my approach is, you know, do I like the thing and is the price better now than it was before? Um, no, that's a, that's you, a totally yeah. fair point actually. And I, I may have, I may have painted you in a, into a, a corner where there's actually no corner. I mean, the, the reality is there's, <laughs> got it. there's, you've got a, a list of companies, you've got a cash flow forecast. Um, the growth rate is, is reasonably um, stable. They have quasi monopolistic qualities like Airbnb, for example, or Alibaba. Like a lot of the, a lot of the companies you, that you've mentioned have sort of quasi monopolistic qualities in their segment, right? So, if you if you understand the size of their potential market, and you can observe the the growth rate and draw some error error terms around the trajectory of, of revenue growth and acknowledge some hiccups along the way, like, like a global pandemic, right? Then you've got a, a reasonable sort of band of where you'd like to own the stock. And then it becomes this sort of waiting game, I guess, right? Where like, I, I, I know the stock is, I love the stock here. It's trading here. I'm going to sort of stink bid, maybe not like systematically stink bid, but I am waiting on the sidelines with capital to capture this opportunity when it comes along right you, you when there's a liquidity event yeah. or whatever so i guess like i want snowflake I, I want to own snowflake so badly but i can't i can't buy it yet yeah so so you're sort of <laughs> profiting off the volatility of the market right like there's yeah. there's there's events in the market that cause through that have almost nothing to do with fundamentals most of the time that cause um the valuations to fluctuate dramatically and you want to be there to capture yeah those th those major those major drops and 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 accumulate when you're presented with those opportunities right so it's it's less about having better forecasts and more maybe about um being more flexible in your investment approach so you're sort of waiting for the for the for the ball to hit you in the strike zone rather than than, than swinging at every at every pitch, right? Is that yep. is that a reasonable kind of way to? So yep. so, how do you manage? How do you manage AUM? Like you've got you, you got OPM, and you're waiting for fat pitches, and you, you just happen to be in a six to twelve month period where, you know, so there's capital flowing in, but there's no fat pitches. How how do you manage that excess cash, or how do you manage the strategy in that type of environment? Yeah. So the, again, this is where the, I have been, I didn't even know the ETF could do all of these things uh, until I started managing one publicly, but I've been very pleasantly surprised to know that it actually offers you a couple of tools and options with that. So the, the default for most ETFs are money comes in, you get some creation units uh, that then buys everything in your fund uh, in exactly the proportion that your fund currently owns it. Um, so it usually doesn't go to cash. It usually goes to, you know, buying all these shares at current prices. And, you know, as we talked about, sometimes even things in our own portfolio are prices where we don't really want to own more of them. And, uh, one of the cool things about the ETF is you can say, Hey, in lieu of, I'll keep picking on Airbnb because they were really expensive for a while in lieu of Airbnb, when a new investor buys the ETF, go ahead, let them buy all the shares that are in there. But for that Airbnb piece, I want their cash instead. And what that does is that prevents that new investor, and then you know by by extension, you know the whole group of fund investors from having to share in a very expensive share price acquisition. And now the follow up part of your question of well, what do I do with that cash? It, it, it's very heavily dependent on what what's currently out there what's currently available I, I i shared a little bit earlier about how cloud service is a little bit cheaper so that's an area that those are like two and a half percent positions for us that we're pushing up to three to three and a half percent 
uh, with prices where they are. So it's heavily dependent on what's what's going on. We'll either leave it in cash, we'll put it in a in sort of a high cash yielding BDC uh, if we think the credit's really good, uh, or we'll use it to buy more of our other stocks uh, in the portfolio accordingly. So that raises a, a few interesting things to deal with, right? Like one of the, it's a transparent ETF. You could conceive of a situation where investors are observing that you're, they're paying you a fee, but 35 or 50% of the portfolio is in cash just because there's no, there's no opportunities, right? You, that is a legitimate value, right? You're, you're, you're adding value by keeping this in cash because the cash is really a call option on the ability to buy the stocks you want at cheaper prices, but optically it may be unpalatable, right? So yeah. do you do you foresee that? How, how do you foresee managing around that? You guys are good. You're getting, you're getting all the good ones. So, uh, so with the SEC, we said in our prospectus that we would seek to not have more than a 10% cash position under you know, regular sort of market circumstances. Um, technically, we have the ability to move the whole portfolio to cash uh, if we wanted to. Um, there's a good, uh, again, uh, borrowing from my uh, uh, buddy that, that runs a hedge fund. Um, there's there's this analysis that they always share because hedge funds have, uh, they're always trying to keep their investors in their funds. And there's some stat where a very small fraction of days or weeks of market performance drive 80% plus of eventual market returns. So if you're swinging in and out of the market that violently, there is a very high chance you're increasing the odds that you're going to miss the small fraction of days that drive 80% of the eventual upside that exists in the market. So first off, I don't, I don't believe in being that active because I don't think anyone can be that's I just don't think the odds and the probability stacks up really well in your favor uh, in light of that. Um, so uh, for us with like managing a cash position, I think of it as uh, in at the beginning of this year, we, we did have a pretty high cash position as a result of those Airbnb flows we were getting. And we were, we were getting kind of high. We were in that eight to 12 percent range. And we were looking, I felt, the, I say, uh, as, a, as a manager for the analysis I just shared, I, f I definitely felt pressure to allocate that money. But on the other hand, I didn't get pushback from any investors that said, hey, what the hell, you have our money, like, go put it to work. Uh, I think, you know, as you very eloquently laid out, it's like, hey, but you've articulated that you have the strategy of owning these good businesses you like. And then along the way, you need to have some of that optionality, you know, cash powder to be able to grab them, uh, you know, when something happens to the price. Yeah. And I, I guess um, the positions that you have in the portfolio, just based on the names that you've mentioned, even though you may have a large cash position, the overall beta of the portfolio is going to be well over one. Right. Even 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 with. A, so. so in other words, that sort of market timing element is less of an issue because you've got some nice implicit leverage, like beta style leverage on the underlying positions. So even if you've got a 20 or 25 percent cash position, you've probably got a beta to the market greater than one. Um, yeah, well, we only have a two and a half percent cash position right now. So we're not we're definitely not pushing the cash out. In fact, I'm going to take this so far as it, I don't know that it it's too practical to talk about things that don't exist yet, but the conversation I'm having with, you know, the guys at Alpha Architect that I work with right now is this portfolio relative to the S and P is cheaper than it's been, a, not on an absolute value basis, but on a relative value basis. And I look at that and say, well, what about gearing up the fund a little bit? So as opposed to having a 2% cash position, what would it look like to take on five to 8% debt, to get a little bit of gearing in the portfolio to drive a little bit of excess return as well. I don't know if that's something that you guys have explored and other strategies. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, we certainly, <laughs> we're, 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 we're in the future space, most of it. So we are your plenty of leverage, yeah. but we are highly diversified. When only you eight leverage. is the only words I have to yeah, say to you. Eight, only eight. eight. Only eight. Here? Come on now. <laughs> okay. now, speaking of 25 that leverage, minimum. So, 
the ETF allows you to use, or the, whatever regulatory framework the ETF, it's, it's a um, tr transparent ETF, allows you to use as much as 150% leverage, I think. Is that, did I get that right? I don't know the answer to that yet. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah, either it will have leeway, but it'll depend yeah. on. I think it was what the perspective thirty, is. but it's somewhere in there. Yeah, uh, so but the, a lot of that's going to depend on how expensive is that debt, because presumably it gets more expensive the more and more of your assets that you encumber, and then this also gets to you know ETF volatility, where this is a publicly traded fund, assets can evaporate out of that thing, so you got to be real careful about uh, you know how much you're bartering against that, because that's 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 how a fund blows up. Um, is borrowing money you can't can't pay back. Well, you'll pay it back. It's just not going to have a very nice effect on <laughs> okay. the other securities that are going to be liquidated at an opportune time yeah. to pay it back. So, so five I will to say, if you're you unwilling have, you to take on leverage in this environment, you're unlikely to want to take on leverage in any environment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the fair. cost of capital has never been cheaper. So exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, by the way, I, not to get into the inflation thing, but we, people just kept peppering us with. What are you going to do about inflation? What are you going to do about inflation? And I've always said the best thing you can do with inflation is borrow money. Yep. Long term, low cost money. So if that's the best thing you can do in inflation, how is that something we might be able to reflect at the fund level? So that's a, that's that's where my head's been at recently. Okay. Well, let's get into inflation. You, you we chatted before the show, and you, you clearly have an interest in macro. So. Um... Where are you? What, how do you think about macro? Where do you think we are in the macro cycle? And um, how are you? I, how are you navigating? That? <laughs> I liked what I liked what Carl Icahn said the other day, where he was basically like, uh, "Make no mistake, it's here," and uh, no one has ever been able to forecast anything with a high level of accuracy. So having the Fed sitting there saying, you know, transitory or saying it's coming back down. Why would why would they even take the risk of screwing that up? Why don't they say we don't know what's going to happen? It's obviously happening, but if it happens for a persistently long enough amount of time, then we will take action. That to me is like the uh, the correct like long term oriented like let's align people around as the data comes, we will make decisions as opposed to no, nope, it's going to be different in the future. Well, I think I think that comes from the from the realization that inflation is not just a number; it's also uh, State it, it's of mind. fueled by people, individuals, and what they believe the future inflation is going to be. So, if the Fed comes out and says we have no idea, look look at that that runaway number. It might be runaway, or it might be uh, uh, just you know a couple of more months. If they say we, it might be runaway, then individuals will act that way. And I can I can tell you from um, South America, from Peru, I can I've seen runaway inflation get worse when the wrong words come out of the leadership, right? Yeah. So I think they I think their their only choice is to always say that it's transitory inflation. Mm -hmm. Like when when will you hear them say, oh, this is you know what this isn't transitory. This one's legit. We're gonna have massive inflation in the next couple of years. They're yeah. never gonna say that. Well, they have to say transitory. It's, it's, been, it's been complemented by the fact that they have been so successful at jawboning the market. And this may be another step in them just jawboning the market with respect to, no, it's not. We know better than you. Um, we'll save you at any price. All, all, the, all the, the number of times through the last, God, what is it, more than a decade now where we've seen central banks actually state things that they will do or see or say, and they have not needed to even do anything about them because the job owning in and of itself has accomplished the goal from a market stability perspective. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, that that's part of it, which is a very dangerous situation, right? It does set the stage for the system itself to reach sort of a, a position of criticality where it's deny, 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 and a sudden realization of a new paradigm. So it's a really interesting game that's being played of, of chicken, if you will, between, you know, the, the central banks and, and the markets themselves, I, th I think. I mean, I mean but, Rodrigo, that's pretty but, but, convincing, man. That's like the Fed's only shot at keeping inflation low is trying to keep expectations low. Mm -hmm. 
You're absolutely right. I mean, that that's the textbook thing, which is inflation is an expectations driven uh, result. Or a large portion uh, of it, it is. It is, but that, also right? you've got yeah. a massive fiscal shock, right? So we know there's yeah. a demand shock because we've got deficits in the public sector, which materialize as um, credits in the private sector. A chunk of that flows through the economy. So that is a major demand shock. And they've already said that they're going to blow this demand through the economy through infrastructure spending. So there will be a massive uptick in demand. The question hap- it, I'm, I'm struggling with is when we do see inflation, the treasury still needs to finance its deficits. Hmm. So will the Fed play chicken with the treasury? No. Like is the is the Fed gonna say I'm I'm no longer gonna buy the, these Treasury bonds in order to help fund these deficits? I don't think so. So yeah. the Treasury will continue to to have implicit permission to fire hose funds through the economy, and then the only policy response is through taxation. So that the taxation channel is the only potential moderating channel, and we have a wealth distribution that is such that those at the very top with zero marginal propensity to spend and who are capturing the excess profits in the economy have an ability to um, modify tax policy through regulatory capture that wasn't present in other episodes like the one that we're currently in, right? Like in the 1920s, Mm the capital classes had been neutered by the Great Depression. So their ability to engage in regulatory capture and and alter tax policy was massively moderated, right? They just didn't have the resources to do it. Now, those at the top of the food chain have the resources to manage the laws in whatever direction they want. So the tax channel is vulnerable to regulatory capture the Fed is not going to play chicken or not going to blink in a game of chicken with the Treasury. So how exactly are we going to moderate the inflation impulse? I have a uh, you're you're taking me down another path here, which is I um, I think the business model of the United States uh, government is uh, very flawed. Um, and requires some pretty significant restructuring. And I think it, it, a, it a demo, in a democracy, it's going to take a very long time to restructure it. So can I, this ties back to the inflation stuff a little bit, but go on permission man. to a, continue. Give it a whirl. <laughs> okay. This is so, free, free form conversation, man, <laughs> organic. Let's go. This uh, is the good stuff. It always takes an hour to get to good stuff. So, um, Ninety uh, percent plus of government receipts, federal government receipts, are tied to salaries. Whether that's uh, payroll taxes and employers are paying, whether that is income taxes that individuals are paying on their base salaries and their bonuses and everything else. And the issue with this is that anyone that's made money or become wealthy or whatever in the past few decades has done so building a business, building equity, not paying themselves a penny of salary because that's mm-hmm. one of the worst. If you're the CFO at a business, you're looking at this being like, how can I incentivize all my employees, you know, long-term with equity, pay them as little cash today because the company doesn't have any cash to pay them yet. And that way we grow the company as much as possible. We build equity for everybody. And that's also very tax efficient because they're only paying, you know, 15% long-term capital gains, this set or the other on. By the way, there's lots of other rules out there like qualified small business income uh, that prevents uh, business builders from having to pay any taxes at all on the first $10 million in equity that they generate for themselves. So now those are those are great things to have for the incentives of building businesses and making America competitive. But for a government that only gets money off of salaries, for the most part, uh, it is at an enormous disadvantage to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull in our, our friends across the Pacific here of China. If you look at tax receipts at the Chinese government, they've got income taxes, 30 or 40% of their receipts. 
they've got VAT, that magical European thing where suppliers are having to, you know, pay, you know, taxes uh, uh, along supplier chains. That obscene uh, regressive tax policy. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> name it for what it is. Uh, name it for what it is. Uh, they do not yet have, but are talking about introducing a property tax uh, at the federal level, or at least distributing it at the state level. And a lot of what they're doing is stealing from things that have worked really well in the U.S. And they're just, frankly, a bit faster at implementing them. And then they have consumption taxes. Uh, and then, of course, there's capital gains and other traditional things like that. And so if you look at their you know, pie chart of government receipts, that, is a that government is a diversified holding company. And if one of those segments sucks, they've got three other segments doing other things, you know, to help them. And so this is my like issue and concern with like U.S. government business model is that they're heavily exposed to one source of cash. And that one source of cash is not anywhere where anyone that is deploying capital is trying to deploy more. You know, you hear the circular argument of salaries haven't grown in however many years oh, but the government only collects money off of salaries and they're talking about, you know, are they going to raise taxes on salaries or not? I'm just like, it's not going to fix the problem. So I think it is an extremely, it's obviously a very political problem to solve, uh, but I think unquestionably for the U.S. to, you know, either maintain our number one position or be competitive over the next 50 years, I think that pie chart has got to change from 90% salaries to less than 50% salaries and 50% other shit. So is it, this we, is we a case of probably that there needs to crisis. Be a diversity of, of yeah, tax but that that's only going to be accomplished through crisis. It's it, it's a a crisis necessity change type scenario, and it's well the crisis may be just. I mean, we we we've, we've seen an escalation like in and these these um, emergent uh, crises like the the storming of the Capitol type. Um, phenomena and and occupy wall street and so these types of phenomena are accelerating in their frequency and as the wealth distribution continues to get steeper and steeper this is likely to get th these types of crises are likely to explode more frequently and more violently and and, and so though that might be the type of urgency or crisis that that you're but, referring to that, that but does it lead yeah, agreed but does it lead to a more socialist state less competitive state rather than the emergence of some sort of reaction that is more entrepreneurial in some way right so when you see the the transition of societies over time there seems to be that you know the the u.s dominance followed by or the uk's dominance followed by them falling to the next uh leader the us may be falling to china it, do you think that the us has what it takes even in that crisis what choice are they going to make are they going to make the choice to placate the uprising with more socialistic uh driven programs which is which maybe are not going to drive the kind of entrepreneurial fervor think, that's required I mean, one of the you know the um, i think the economics professors let's let's leave aside uh capital gains you know for a second because that's that's clearly the hot one that people are deciding whether or not should be taxed a little bit more heavily or close loopholes or whatever um at a minimum on the salary versus consumption side uh there's the theory that says um you should be taxing more aggressively at the consumption level than at the salary level uh, to have a more prosperous society. And purely from an efficiency game and you know diversifying government revenues and all those things, uh, you could certainly start to see how, hey, how do we figure out how to, you know, tax salaries aren't even growing. So dear God, why are we taxing those anymore? Uh, they're only ironically making it less attractive to then continue to use salaries as an incentive tool. Uh, and instead, you know, start to pull on things like a consumption tax or something else like that. Well, it, it certainly puts the taxation back into the consumer's hands, right? You get to choose on a consumption tax how much tax you'd like to pay. Really? Yeah. Uh, Is that right? Well, Those in the bottom let, half let of, me, the, of the income qualify. distribution are able no, to choose sorry, whether they sorry, buy Adam. gasoline let me, and food. Let me qualify that. So when we say a luxury tax or a consumption tax or what I mean is more of at some level of spending that ticks up to be rather onerous 
So if you would like to own a Lambo instead of a Honda Civic, you are going to pay a much larger tax on that particular item so that the, the consumption tax is more, more tilted towards the higher net worth or higher income folks who are spending that money. Because it's, as you say, you, you want to keep the lower end of um, the, the, the socioeconomic strata relatively tax free or neutral or in, this, in the sense of a consumption tax. But as you go up the consumption stack, you're going to tax it more. I don't know how you do that, uh, but it, it seems to me to make sense because then you're allowing, you're putting taxation into the hands of the consumer. You would like to consume. How much would you like to consume? Here's your tax bill. Well, it's if you'd like way. to save that money. Oh, sure. I'm, I'm sorry. It's not the way. I'm not just suggesting it's the way. Please propose another way. Well, I mean, no. I mean, the, the, the only, the, 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 what's missing in that is that you're not, taxing away that portion of a person's income and or wealth that was gained through community support, through pure, pure luck or happenstance, through, you know, um, lucky timing of, of birth or. Well, well, well hold on a second. Let, or let, let's say, so I'm, I'm sitting there, I have a million dollars, it's a windfall or $10 million. I can do a couple things with it. One, I can invest it. If I invest it, that actually is not a horrible thing for the economy and for those around me. Um, I can also spend it. And if you do have a cons consumption tax at higher levels of, of consumption, you will push more of that to investment, I would suppose, because if I'm a if I'm a consumer and say, well, okay, now maybe I will drive a Honda Civic rather than the Lambo because the Lambo is not 10x, it's 30x because there's no, no, a 20x in tax. I mean, and if we continue down this path, what will happen is that Jeff Bezos will own 99% of all yep. wealth. Yep. And therefore, we don't need to worry about a consumption tax because there's going to be no one else earning any income. Sure. Right. So this is just purely a function of the Pareto me mechanics of wealth accumulation. So this. Well, no, but that, there, that is, there is an uprising. The, the there's a place for that is. There's is, a matrix moment that comes. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know what? I think at the end of the day, the way to do this, a lot of this in the redistribution is the estate tax, right? We've talked Amen, about this brother. in the past. The fact that you mentioned it just briefly, but the idea that the problem is this is a very American ideal that you, you work hard, you get, you do the, the right thing. You have a meritocracy, you reach the American dream. You don't get lucky. You work hard and that's why you become a billionaire where in fact, I think very few that are at the top will not recognize that they've gotten really incredibly lucky, right? Timing my business, you know, a little bit of smarts and a little bit of gumption, sure. But a large portion of that money is pure luck that should be redistributed to society. Now, it seems like the right thing to do, and it seems like something that even the seems like a terrible behind, idea. Right? Hold up Let's a take Let finish. the money Let from the finish. people that are smart and just finish. throw it away to the exactly, society. Exactly. Right. So this is because nobody <laughs> believes that that there's any luck involved. But the problem with trying to convince the rich to do that is that okay, let's assume that I'm going to be okay with at death, my family doesn't get anything. Eighty percent goes back to the government. What is the government going to do with that? And more specifically. Is there any link between taxation and, sp and government spending right now no, in the United there's States? There's no reason for it right? to so go why, to like, what? the government. You can just cancel the wealth. It literally just cancel. It's ones and zeros that is sure. removed from the financial system. Yeah, deflation. Because we're never managing good, though. the total amount of money in the system in order to target a certain level of consumption relative to the ability of the economy to produce. You're burning if tokens. The, amount of consumption available exceeds what the economy can produce that creates inflation if the if the amount that the economy can produce exceeds what can be consumed that is that's deflation so the idea is you want to create enough money and put it in the hands of the right mix of people so that your your spending matches your your productivity and you want to expand the money supply in at the rate of productivity growth to mike's point you get more productivity growth through investment right so that's a that is a fair point mm -hmm. but there's there's a large amount of capital that was earned but was was just you know earned through luck and the the correlation between the ability of a person who was able to earn money through 
you know, one segment of their life in a certain way and their ability to turn around and then compound capital at a similar rate or even an above average rate in a different context is pretty well near zero. It, so that's it, a, it's it's not like we don't have examples of this, though. The UK does this. The UK has substantial inheritance taxes of in the, in the 30 to 50 percent range. So it's not like this experiment isn't being done. And I'm not sure the UK is a shining. No, no, I, I agree. Of, but the challenge is access. always jurisdictional arbitrage anyway, right? Yeah. There is a property tax or is, a state tax that nobody pays, except yeah. those at the, in the middle income bracket. No, in, in the UK, pay. it's paid. It's, there, there's very, very few ways to escape it, as I understand it, in, in the UK system. Yeah. And, well, the and UK so, system is a lot flatter than the US system. But, too. Yeah. And, and ultimately, I think the reason oh, there's right. not going to be any buy-in from the billionaires is because they would argue, as I would possibly, you know, this is a good argument, is that you can give the money, nobody's going to burn the money, so I'm just going to put that, that idea to the side. Um, but you, instead of giving it to the government, who uses it inefficiently, you have the, the Gates Foundation that is using their money to actually do, do good outside of the United States and globally with the vaccines and whatnot. They're, they're more efficient. They've run a business. They've run their foundations like a business. They can do a better job, right? Similar thing that Bezos is doing and in a way Elon Musk, right? So the, the utility of those billionaire dollars might be seen as being more efficient than any government can pull off by estate tax. Yeah, so sure. there's an argument for that. I, and that's I the argument I would make if I were, when I, I become I think a billionaire. There's, th there's concerns I have about the perversions that happen when that money gets into government and all of the kickback scenarios and the, the, the money will shift a power dimension to government in a way that I'm not sure how that works out. But hold on, I'm hold actually on. What interested. What I want to know is what would Bono say? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, what's Bono going to do very with his money? Is he, <laughs> like, is, is he going to do what a, Rob has to I say, believe. and I want the Bono stories. I'm going to first. Part. I'm going to first say that I have a lot of respect that the three of you uh, work together and work together so well because in that bit that we just heard, those were three very different um, prioritization of values, three different opinions about the way to fix it. And I am very impressed because it is not very common uh, in our country at the moment to have that many difference of views still smiling uh, and laughing with each other at the end that's of the discussion. That's what puts a smile on our face, man. That, yeah. That's what <laughs> makes resolve go around, I can tell you. That was a very cool thing to see. Um, Jump in I'll, with your thoughts, but give yeah. us, give us well, a floor. I'll, I may say, I'll, I'll say that um, I, I believe, uh, I have uh, all the ability to point out the problems. Uh, I am wildly incapable at knowing any of the solutions. Uh, but I like the way you posed the question, uh, which is, uh, what would Bono do? Uh, <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> one of the funniest things about him, uh, he, his business instincts, his product instincts are really good. Um, this one time we were in a meeting and um, God, this guy, there was, there was some promoter trying to, to sell us some kind of rip off American Idol show. And they're like, oh, it's so valuable. We just need $300 million to make the first two seasons and you get to own it forever. It's going to be amazing. Uh, and they, they, they didn't have any sort of direction over how it would differentiate or what market it was tapping into. That was really big. And, you know, Bono would do this thing because he'd normally wear his sunglasses. And, and sometimes if you really wanted people to pay attention to him. Uh, you know, he'd take off his sunglasses, he'd sort of set them on the table, and he was these really pale blue eyes, and I can't do an Irish accent, but he'd say, like, you know, the dirty secret about you 2 is that we were the world's most successful Christian rock band. <laughs> but we never, ever, ever told our fans that. You know, we let them create the illusions. We let them create the mantras. You can't, you know, you can't put it in their faces like that. You know, that was, that was our version of going after the biggest market in the goddamn world, Christianity. Amazing. What can we bring? What can we, it was really funny and sweet and beautiful. Uh, anyway, he had, he had all sorts of little, you know, sayings and things like that. Now, you know, the other thing about him, I think um, that, uh, that he gets a lot of credit for is that he has been as successful with both getting both liberals and conservatives to open up their wallets for uh, 
uh, for causes that he can get that he can kind of unite people around. I mean, Apple is still selling red products today. I think that's likely to go away, you know, at some point in the near future. That deal existed because of that guy. Uh, so I think I think he had a very unique ability at uh, not overly joining one side and uh, finding a finding um, issue or call it solutions specific enough that he could get people to join with him and there didn't have to be any sort of like party line debate about it. So that's something that I often think about and, you know, sort of conflict resolution and things like that is how do we narrow the issue to something so specific that everyone can agree enough to move forward on it in some way or the other. That's brilliant, so, actually. That, 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 yeah. that is a way, that's the way change has been done. If you think about certain circumstances, there's always one pinpoint of agreement and then it grows from there. Yes, yeah, right? the foot in the door. Yeah, that's a that's a really that's a, that's a mind blowing insight. Actually, <laughs> it's obvious. Yeah. It's, it's mind blowing because it's so obvious when you think about how change occurs and how waves of those of that that sort of the, the Overton window of public discourse on a topic how that happens. It's usually from one thing that everyone can agree on. And then that agreement sort of grows. So what are we, what is that, what is that policy plank that can bring, bring people together at the moment? Does anyone have any insight? Reese's peanut butter cups are better than Mars I bars. think they're getting there on infrastructure. I think they're getting there. You yeah, know, no, Republicans no, right. just move their number up, you know, liberals will take some time with it. It feels like it's, it feels like it's starting to happen. Like I'm getting politics less in my Facebook, Instagram, you know, Drudge Report, Huff Post, like it's all kind of cooling off a little bit. So, you know what? That's know, actually less to complain that is about. so true. And, you know, once the pandemic news kind of rolls off over the next year or so, what are we going to do with all our spare time? Right. Like we spent <laughs> four years obsessing over Trump. We're going to go outside. We, you know, just like yeah, we tell yeah, our kids right? to do. Yeah. Ex ex exactly. <laughs> like, you know, go, go play with your kids, go, go swing a baseball bat, go kick a soccer ball, go hit a tennis ball, but it'll be kind of nice think, just to go back to normal. I mean, the quote that Richard actually sent us through Slack yesterday, I think works here. Convincing someone to change their mind is really the process of convincing someone to change their tribe. If they abandon their beliefs, they run the risk of losing social ties. You can't expect someone to change their mind. If you take away their community too, you have to give them somewhere to go. Nobody wants their worldview torn apart if loneliness is the outcome, right? So I think if you're trying to do a wholesale change and like your tribe is wrong, come to my tribe or just your, your tribe is wrong and they don't have a tribe, the people that they've known and they've, they've communicated with, that they've texted with Twitter, Reddit, whatever you want, and then all of a sudden you break their brain, then it's not going to work. And, and I, I like the idea of finding a, a single point of commonality and working through that. And then, you know, slowly but surely, one at a time, hopefully creating either a new tribe or, or uh, neutralizing the extremes, right? Yep, totally. I'm starting the... I don't know what you guys, I'm going to be listening to every track. single YouTube, or you, YouTube, YouTube <laughs> In a whole new way, song, right? now through the lens of Christianity. <laughs> Sunday, bloody Sunday. It's like, Why it's Sunday? like, yeah, it's it, it, I feel like, what was the movie set when the, where the kid's dead and through the whole thing? Uh, you have the well, realization. Sixth Sense. Sixth, yeah. Sixth, Sixth Sense. sense yeah. At the end of the movie, you have the realization, oh, Jesus. Bono is the architect <laughs> of yes. the Matrix. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Amazing. So um, anyways, uh, this has been great. Um, Robert, this is, you know, I, I, uh, I honestly had no idea what, I to expect coming on because uh, I had not done very much homework, but this has actually been really interesting. And um, I thank you so much for volunteering your time on a Friday afternoon to come out and chat with. We can be get we can we can off road quite a bit as you've seen, and um, it, it's often hard to know where the conversation goes. So yeah, Adam, yeah, as as casual so. and as interesting as advertised. Very cool. Thank That's you for letting me. Uh, yeah, Robin. Good into luck, it. man, with the uh, the highly concentrated portfolio approach. We're big fans of that, and it's yeah. it's a battle out there. But you got the right guys with Alpha Architect. Uh, Where can our audience find you? Uh, that's a good question. I think you know we've been very pleasantly surprised. Uh, every Friday, we release a short little video. It's three minutes long. 
you know, we'll put on YouTube and Twitter and LinkedIn. And in it, we basically condense the research or the insight from the week. We're doing all sorts of, we talked about all that research stuff we were doing before. And the idea mm -hmm. is on Friday, what's the one largest takeaway that we had as an investment team from the week? And that's something that we share publicly. And a lot of early investors have been thanking us for it and encouraging us to keep doing it. Um, so I'm going to use that as the as the first place to to experience us. Um, but yeah, we're just upholdings on on Twitter or YouTube. Uh, so those are the easiest places to find it. At upholdings, U P H O L D I N G S. Okay. Yeah. So two things on that. Uh, what was what were the insights for the week this week in in uh, 30 seconds or less? And because I've seen you also talk about what are the top questions coming from the field. Um, sort of, you know, your your top company, their clients or in your research meeting. So two part question, which is a terrible thing to ask. But one, what what did you discover this week? And what's the, what are the top questions coming from the field for you? Yeah, it's, it's like quarterly earnings calls, the equity analysts just jamming them all in. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the quick insight from today was about, um, I mean, the S&P 500 has had a killer start to the year. Uh, and it hasn't been the FANG stocks. It hasn't been, which, which were historically the largest driver of S&P returns over the last you know, five to 10 years. Um, so uh, it has been about some of the valuation dislocation that we've seen. We, we sort of picked the cloud services segment specifically. Uh, because the cloud infrastructure providers, the uh, the enterprise software makers, and the specific application developers uh, have all traded down like you know 20, 30 percent since the beginning of the year, while the S P is up 15 percent. So when you see a 35 percent valuation dislocation between one basket of securities and another, and this cloud services segment, by the way, their customers are mostly the S P 500. So if the companies in the S&P 500 are doing well and these guys are growing their revenue 30% plus over here, that means that they are in effect extracting cash from the successful businesses in the S&P 500. So that was the thing that we kind of talked about today uh, and uh, starting to look at some of the valuations of, um, of those businesses uh, for potential investment. And the second part of the question is, what is the most common question you would get? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> these are ridiculous. I mean, the, technic these, technically, the answer to this question is either should I buy Bitcoin or I don't understand ARC. Can you explain it to me? <laughs> are the, those are the two most common questions. We don't always answer them because they're not. Go ask ARC if you want to know what ARC does. Yep. And, you know, we're not a commodity fund. So go ask a commodity investor if you want to know what to do with uh, Bitcoin. But yeah, technically, those are our two most asked questions. Very cool. All right. All right. Well, we'll have to and cover those that. in the next uh, round. Yeah. So I, 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 I had a couple Bitcoin. questions that I, that, I, that I didn't get to ask, but we're, we're past the time. And that will leave some questions for next time. So away we go. Exactly. I'm going to leave them. I'm going to hang them. Hang them before the commercial. And as always, all of you who are listening, like, hit that like button, share, share these with, with um, friends, family, share them, proliferate them everywhere so that we can get more great guests like Robert on. And uh, Robert, thanks again for coming and joining us. And we look forward to seeing you in the future. Yep. Very Best fun. Of luck, man. Have a great thanks, weekend. Guys. Have a great long weekend. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And to all of you listening, have a great weekend and join us again next week. We will. Oh, yeah. This episode is brought to you by Resolve Asset Management, Inc.'s separately managed accounts, available for U.S. and Canadian investors. While diversification is often discussed, it is important that it actually be delivered. Through the suite of Resolve Global mandates offered at varying risk levels, we aim to strike the balance between global diversification, appropriate risk balance, and directional alpha. Our portfolios are designed to safeguard and profit across many economic regimes, including periods of negative growth shocks or unexpected rising inflation, periods in which, in our view, the traditional 60-40 portfolios may fail to deliver adequate returns for investors. Resolve to improve your portfolio. Click on the link in the description to reach out to a representative and assess which Resolve mandate is right for you.